Welcome to this presentation. It's basically just a crash course on how to use the cameras that we have here at Business Insider. So first, we're just going to go over a couple mistakes that ruin everyone. First, make sure the cap is off. Second, make sure the camera is on. I can't tell you how many great pictures have been lost because of those two mistakes. So the camera's on. What do we do next? First, we're going to go over a couple settings and a little bit of information about a camera and what it is and what it does. So to start off, we just need to understand that today's digital cameras are really very powerful and sophisticated computers. And like computers, there are some things that they do better than people. And also like computers, there are some things that they don't do as well as people. So in the case of the camera, where it really comes uh, to be important to us is that the camera is able to read certain things about the environment around it and come up with certain conclusions or camera settings that are appropriate for that environment. However, the camera doesn't always know what parts of the environment are important to you. And that can be the risk of using automatic. It might be picking up data that you don't want it to pick up and incorporating that into its analysis. So when you have it set to automatic, the camera is just picking up all the data from its environment that it's set to fit up, pick up, and then it's coming up with the appropriate camera settings. And this can work sometimes, but sometimes it doesn't work. So be aware of that when you're using automatic. Uh, AV, or aperture priority, reduces the camera's control and puts a little bit more into your hands. So with aperture priority, you control something called aperture, and the camera will adjust the other settings to make sure that the exposure is correct based on the aperture that you've chosen. And we'll get into what aperture is in a little bit. And in manual, the computer is not reading anything, uh, and you have to choose the settings and then you know set the exposure, and it might be right or it might be wrong, and the camera will just take the picture. And there are other settings, and I advise you to explore them in your own time. But for the purposes here, we're just going to go over these three. And personally, I recommend you use Aperture Priority. But if you feel more comfortable using Automatic, yeah, you should do that. So here's the setting for Automatic. Now you see it's the green box, and it's lined up with that arrow. Here's the setting for Aperture Priority. It's on the AV. Uh, this is the screen when you're on aperture priority, and you can control this uh, F number by moving the little dial that's uh, on the right side of the camera right next to the, um, the button you press to take a picture. And here is the setting for manual. And here is what the screen looks like when you're on manual. Uh, in this setting, if you move the dial that's next to uh, the shutter release button, it will change the shutter speed. And if you press and hold down on the AV button and move that dial, it will adjust your aperture or your f-stop. So we've talked a lot already about exposure, but, but what is exposure? Exposure uh, refers to the lighting of the picture. Basically means, is the picture properly lit? Is it too light or too dark? So the idea is to keep it evenly exposed where it's not too light and it's not too dark. When you're looking at the camera, it will tell you uh, what your exposure is using this bar called the, the meter, or the light meter. And the way the light meter works is if it's at the zero, the little, little bar here is at the zero, it means the picture is properly exposed. If the bar is to the right of the zero, closer to the plus two side, it means that it's overexposed or it will be too bright. And if it's to the left or towards the negative two sign, it means that the picture is underexposed or will be too dark. So how does the camera produce those sort of metering results? It has uh, different metering modes. Uh, one, all the way on the left, is called evaluative. And that means that the camera will sort of average the light settings that it sees in the viewfinder and determine the best average exposure for the whole scene. And the one that I recommend you use is called spot metering, which is this one. And what that does is it only picks up information from a very specific point in the picture, and it will adjust the exposure to that point. The reason I recommend that is because often lighting is not uniform in an entire scene. 
And so if you're using evaluative, you might, you know, it might average in a dark part and a light part, and then neither part is exposed properly. But if you use spot metering, it will only account for the area that you want to be exposed properly, and that area will be exposed properly. So I recommend using spot metering, but you can also use evaluative, or you can experiment with the other settings as well. And an important thing if you're going to use spot metering is to understand autofocus point selection. So this controls two things. One is what element the camera is going to focus on. And the other is what area will the camera pick up and compute you know, light readings for. So usually, you can select the little square in the middle, and the camera will read the information in that square. You, know, you can see it in through your viewfinder, which, which square lights up red right before you take the picture. And that's where the camera's reading its information from. So just make sure that that little red blinking dot is on the area that you want the camera to be uh, paying attention to. So here's an example of an overexposed picture. You can see it's too bright, it's washed out, we've lost details because it's kind of burnt out in certain places, so you know it's too light. And here's a picture that is underexposed. It's not terribly underexposed, um, but it's just a little darker than you would want it to be. So you know you can see that this is darker, that one was lighter. And here's a properly exposed picture. It's got you know, adequate detail in the light areas and adequate detail in the dark areas, and it's got a very nice amount of light in it. So how do you sort of control exposure? Well, there are three main elements, shutter speed, aperture, and ISO. And we're going to start with shutter speed. Essentially, shutter speed controls motion. If you have a faster shutter speed, then you are going to stop motion and freeze time. If you have a slower shutter speed, you're going to have more action. You might start to see blur. You know, this has to do with the fact that shutter speed relates to how long the camera is open to receiving light. So if the shutter is only open for, you know, a split, split second, for one four thousandths of a second, it's only letting in very little light, and whatever it does, it's going to be frozen. If you have it at like one thirtieth of a second, though, you're going to start to get some blur. Sometimes you might want this, generally you don't. My recommendation is for when you're starting out, you try not to go any slower than 1 60th of a second. Shutter speeds are all done with 1 over, or at least for our purposes, they're all going to be like that, because this refers to a fraction of a second. So when you say a shutter speed of 60, what you really mean is a shutter speed of 1 60th of a second. Now, you can actually slow the shutter speed to the point where it becomes one second, or two seconds, or three seconds, or I think these cameras, you can go up to 30 seconds. Now, unless you have a tripod and you know what you're doing with long, ex with long shutter speeds, I would not recommend going slower than 1 30th of a second, and really 1 60th. When you get to 1 30th, you start to get what we call motion blur. The camera actually picks up on the motion of your hands and causes this causes shake and blur and not good looking pictures. So I would recommend if you can, you stay at 1 60th or above. If you can't go below 1 60th and get a decent exposure, then maybe try using the flash. So here's an example of using the shutter speed to effect. Okay, this is done at about 1 25th of a second, and it's slow enough that you get motion, you can see the feet moving, but it's also still fast enough that it can also still freeze some motion if it's, if it's a strong action. So when these people plant their feet down, when that stays strong and that comes out clearly. So here is an example of where you can use a slow shutter speed to create an effect of motion while still getting a crisp picture. Here's another example. This is a much longer shutter speed and this is using uh, a tripod. Um, so that way the background stays very sharp while the people that are moving, you know, are very, um, are blurry, which was the intention here. And here is again another example of using the shutter speed to isolate something. So it's, you know, everything else is kind of blurry because the shutter is slow and the camera is actually moving with this woman 
But what it does is it highlights her face and it highlights her because she's the only thing that's clear. So those are just some examples of how you can use shutter speed uh, to effect. But again, before you get there, just learn how to use it to take crisp pictures. So keep your settings at about 1 60th and um, shoot from there. Aperture is another one of the major variables controlling um, how our pictures are taken and how much light we need for them. So aperture generally refers to um, the width of your lens and it controls depth of field. So when you have, when the lens is bigger, is wider open, you're going to have a shallower depth of field. And when the lens is very small, you're going to have a wider depth of field. So the question you need to consider when you're thinking about what you want your aperture to be is, do I want the whole picture in focus? Or do I just want to focus people's attention on one part of the picture? So maybe I only want a small part of the picture to be in focus. So how do you control this? This is determined by the F number, the F stop or aperture. And similar uh, to sort of shutter speeds, this actually should have a 1 over. So this would be 1 over 5, 6. So a larger aperture is actually 3.5 or 4.2. So just keep that in mind when people talk about larger or smaller apertures. For ease here, we'll use a higher and lower f-stop. <laughs> so when you have a higher f-stop, meaning 5.6 or f7 or f8, then that means that you have a smaller aperture, a smaller hole letting in light, and you have a wider depth of field. Now this also means that you will need a slower shutter speed because we're, again, we're regulating light. So if the hole for the light to get in becomes smaller, you're gonna need to let more light in. If the hole to let light in is wider, you're gonna need to let less light in, and you can shoot at faster speeds. In terms of depth of field, when you have, you know, at 3.5, you can start to get a little selective in which part of the picture you want to be in focus. Once you get above 5.6, especially once you get past seven, or eight or nine, you're going to start to um, see almost the entire picture will be in focus, which can be great, but sometimes you just want a part of the picture in focus. So here's an example of a very wide aperture. I think this was shot at, um, at like a f16. And you can see that you know the entire scene is in focus from the way back is still pretty crisp to the very front is still all in focus. So this whole scene is in focus because you know it's a city shot. The idea is to show all of the action in the city. And so that is best done by keeping it at a wide aperture, keeping it in focus. There still is, though, keep in mind, a kind of center of attention, which is the, the guy handing out leaflets. Here, you have the opposite. You want to focus on one soldier, and you're not too concerned about having the rest of the soldiers in uh, focus, especially because, you know, with, with things like this where it's such a pattern, you know, you don't really need to see each soldier. You, you get the idea. You can see it the way it is now, but this really forces you to look at this young soldier in the front. So this was done using a f3.5 and standing, you know, far away mm -hmm. and using a zoom lens and making sure that the only part of the picture that was in focus was the young man. So that's sort of the ways that you can kind of use aperture uh, and use your f-stop to change your depth of field. All right, and the third big factor in determining you know, your, light, your light situation of your picture is ISO. And ISO, uh, in the old days, used to refer to the speed of your film. Um, we're not going to get into that because this is a basic tutorial on digital photography. So instead, we're just going to give you the basics. ISO has to do with light. When you have a higher number, a higher ISO, it means you need less light, but you're going to have a grainier picture. And when you have a lower number, it means you need more light, but you're going to have a sharper and a crisper image. Generally speaking, you want to shoot on the lowest ISO possible. So ISO should essentially be sort of a last measure. If you can't get the exposure that you want using, by adjusting your shutter speed or your aperture, 
then you can change your ISO and bring it up so that there's more light. So again, try and keep it low. If you can't, if you have to move it up, move it up. And here's just a couple examples though so you can see the difference. This is a really high ISO. It was a night shot outside with no flash. And so it's at here about 4,000. Right? And I needed to do that so that I could get a, a, a not motion blurred picture and try and get him in focus. But you can see that the picture is, is grainy. I mean, not unbearably so, but it's grainier. And if you were to zoom in, you would really start to see um, how, it's, it, you know, how grainy it is. Now here, here is a daytime picture, and it's got a much lower ISO, about uh, 400, and you can see the picture is just much crisper. You know, it uh, it works better here. So that's sort of the difference between these two: is that one will get crisper pictures, and one will get grainier pictures. So in general, like I said, keep it as low as you can, but if you got to push it up, you got to push it up. All right, we're almost done. These are just some basic settings that you should know about and try to understand. And please play with them uh, at your leisure. You know? So feel free to experiment. One of the great things about photography is experimenting. So here's the, the big list that we're going to go through. We have white balance. This deals with the sort of coloring of your pictures. We have drive mode, which deals with the way, you know, the speed at which your camera takes pictures. We have the autofocus point selection, which we talked a little bit about earlier, uh, and deals with where the camera is picking up information. We have the quality, which deals with the quality of your pictures. Metering mode, which will determine, you know, again, how light is read by the camera. Autofocus mode, you know, how the camera is doing its autofocus magic. And the picture style, which are some, you know, settings that you can use to, to change the way the camera processes your images. So let's just get right into it. All right, white balance. White balance deals with um, the sort of light color of your pictures. You might hear people talk about warmer or colder white balances. Generally, colder refers to indoor lights or indoor lighting and is bluish. And warmer refers to more natural lighting, tends to be warmer or redder. Um, in general, these cameras have a good enough system that you can keep it on auto white balance. That said, if you start taking pictures on auto in a certain situation and you look at them and you say, oh, they've got this weird blue tint, then maybe you can try switching around. Uh, you have other settings you can choose from here. This is like the sun. This is for shade. This is for cloudy weather. This is for a tungsten light or a regular, you know, a regular light bulb. This is for um, a fluorescent light bulb. And you'll see the effect that these have on the way your, your, your pictures look. Uh, all the way over here, you have what is called custom white balance, um, but we're not going to get into that right now. You know, you can set your own white balance, uh, which can be useful, but uh, it's not so convenient on these cameras. All right, drive mode. Uh, this, again, just determines how your camera is shooting. Um, in general, I recommend sticking on the single shooting one here. It means that the camera will, will take one picture when you press the shutter. If you put it on this one, it will be high speed shooting, which means that the camera might take two or three uh, exposures or two or three pictures when you press the shutter down. And over here you have remote control, you have a two second timer, and then you have a custom timer. And those will basically relate to, you know, the camera will not fire when you press the shutter, but it will wait a few seconds. And they're generally for use on a tripod or if you're trying to take a picture of yourself. So in general, I would say stay on single shooting. And here we have, again, this is autofocus point selection. You can keep it on automatic selection, which is where the camera will sort of take readings from all of them and then try and figure out which one it thinks you care about. Or you can set it. Uh, you can go down and you can set which point you want the camera to use and then just make sure that that point is on your subject or on what you want the camera to be looking for. All right, quality. I just say leave it on the L with the smooth graph, okay? This has to do with the size of the pictures. You could probably shoot at medium or small. Um, don't shoot in raw. 
but I would just recommend leaving it at large. This is just, it's a nice size picture. It's big enough that you could kind of do anything with those pictures. And they're certainly big enough for the way we use them on the site. So just stay in large. Uh, metering mode, we talked about a little bit before. It's just basically how the camera reads light. So I recommend spot metering because this gives you more control. So you can tell the camera where you want it to read the light from. But if you want to do evaluative, if you want to do um, some of the other settings, then try them out and see which one works best for you. Autofocus, this has to do with the way the camera does autofocus. When it's on one shot, when you press halfway, the camera will sort of focus on whatever the sensor that we just talked about tells it to focus on. And then it'll stop, and if that thing moves, or you move, or whatever, it might be out of focus. If it doesn't move, you'll be fine. Um, AI focus will, the camera will um, alter its focus as the subject changes. And AI servo, the camera will be constantly reevaluating its uh, focus settings uh, depending on changes in the, um, in the picture. Uh, I find that one shot can generally be OK. Um, you could try AI, um, you know, auto, like artificial intelligence focus, and sometimes that works well also. And then we have the picture style, and again here I'm just going to tell you to stay on standard. This has to do with, um, you know, the camera actually processes images before it shows them to you. So the camera could theoretically process them a little slightly different in relation to saturation of colors, to co levels of contrast, to a certain tints, um, to the way it deals with lighting. So there are different settings that might be useful that highlight different aspects of these um, different settings. I, I would say stick with standard, it's, it's usually fine. All right, and here is just sort of what you see after you take a picture. So this is very basic display, shows you the picture that you've taken. You can, um, you can look at it and see it, and that's great. Here we have a different display mode, and here it tells you, uh, gives you a little bit more information, you know, the, the picture size, the picture number in relation to the other pictures on the card. Uh, here you have the picture with the histogram as well as sort of all of your settings, you know? So this is might give you a little more information about it. Um, histograms that this, uh, you know, that uh, graph on the right is something that uh, we're not really gonna get into right now. Uh, we can talk about that in our next session. And here you have a just different set of histograms. This has to do with the the colors, again, I would recommend not concerning yourself with this unless you want to get a lot more involved in photography. So a last step, we're just going to go over basic processing of your photos. I know that you know this information, so apologies for repeating it. Um, connect your SD card to the computer, copy your files, delete them from the SD card, You know, pick the photos you want to use, open them in Photoshop, crop them using the 4 by 3 aspect ratio, you can use a histogram and levels to adjust exposure, then save your files as .jpegs, upload to the system. You know, for source, put your name, space, backslash business insider. I know there are a few variations that go on the site, but this is the uniform one that we're trying to implement. Uh, for your description, be as descriptive as possible. I'm going to give you an example in a second. And for tags, you can fill these in as general terms for an assignment and autofill them. So they don't have to be as specific to each picture, but they can be a little bit broader. And then when you're done, click Create Slideshow. So here's a picture that is one of our stock images. And you want to describe it as completely as possible for two reasons. The first is that any information you assign to the description becomes associated with your photos on the internet. And this can help improve your SEO. Your articles can get picked up if somebody searches for words that are in your description of your pictures, and it just, it just improves your SEO. So it's a good practice. And number two is it will make our photo system more efficient and easier to, for people to find photos within our system so they don't have to spend as much time searching Flickr or AP or the internet to find photos. They can just search within our system and find photos.
So here's the picture. And here's the description that I used for it. And I use variations of terms in case somebody searches for cop instead of cops. You know? And this way, you just have as many terms as you think might apply to this picture uh, in there. And that way, people can find it easily. And it improves the SEO of stories that use this picture. Uh, you know this format. It's just the form that you fill in. So just fill it in, you know, description, source, tags. You know the drill. And that's it. So that is how it works. Now just go out and shoot and have some fun. And if you have any other questions, feel free to look me up in the office.